What's up, students? It's Pastor G. Listen, I know a new school year can bring mixed emotions, but our team is here to help you not just survive another year, but slay. Is there a cricket infestation? Okay, thrive, starting with back to school Sunday and back to school bash. Here you'll experience biblical teaching, meet good friends, and of course have insane fun. Check out the events on our social media or at myffc.com slash back to school. We hope to see you there. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. How many of you woke up this morning and you said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Uh, now, make sure you're not just clapping. Did you really say that? Or did you say, I'm really sleepy. Get me some coffee. I don't know. <laughs> we, we got a little bit of both of those, don't we, sometime? But I want to thank you for making our, what God does among us possible this morning. And, you know, John Wesley said this when he was on his deathbed, famous words. He said, and best of all, God is among us. Some of you know that's true, right? Best of all, God is among us. And it's so Good to experience God's presence with God's people. Uh, I want to thank all of you who were a part of Serve Day yes, yesterday. Uh, man, we had uh, 870, 837 kids get help for school supplies. So I thought that was fantastic. And then a lot of you helped social agencies as well. And I want to give a big shout out to HEB. They really invested generously to help kids get back to school. And a lot of people don't know that they also really have invested heavily in developing leaders and teachers in our state to bless our kids. And a lot of business owners, I love that about our community. A lot of business owners are really invested in our community. And I want to thank you this morning if you're a business owner. I also want to thank you if you are one of the 100 plus people who didn't just uh, get involved with school supplies, but also we were involved with about 12 different social agencies, and we were involved helping them. And you know, have you noticed that when you take time to love people and to listen to people and to help them get through a difficult season in their life, that you serve them better and you speak better to them? Have you noticed that? And uh, a lot of us, if we want influence in people's hearts, it really does start with loving better and listening better. Because Hebrews 4 says this, when we come to the throne of God's grace, we can always count on God to have mercy, which means not just that God's going to be nice to us, <laughs> but it means we're going to know God cares for us and about us. And we're going to know that he understands what we're going through and he knows the perfect word to say. And if we're not that way as a church, what happens is we say things, but they just kind of bounce off people, and they don't really go into their hearts like they could. I love Colossians 3, where it talks to us about Christian virtues and living with Christian virtues and how it changes everything in our world. And then at the end, it says, and over all these virtues, I want you to put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. So we can be calling people to virtue, but whenever we begin to put love around it, it connects us to people. Can you say amen? And uh, I, I love that because I really think that's something that's on God's heart in this day that you and I are in. I, I interview pastors from across the country on bi-weekly webinars, and I always ask them to just share, what's the thing that God's put on your heart this year that can really help other pastors? And this week we had one who said, you know, I'm realizing that we live in a day when values and principles that we live with in our communities are even more important than the mission statements we have as a church. Man, I thought that was so good. Because people are looking for people who can bring the values into their life that cause God to bless them. Amen? And I know I'm really speaking long in the welcome this morning, so thank you for bearing with me. I feel a little bit, though, like the pastor in this season who said, man, I'm just so full of stuff from God that I don't even know where to start. And the guy stood up in the back and said, how about at the end of your sermon? That'd be a great place to start. But thank you for not doing that to me this morning. Amen. But uh, seriously, I, I really believe this is going to be a great season. 
And I believe that the church is going to mean more to our neighbors and the, and the next generation. And we're going to see God do something mighty in this hour that you and I live in. Do you believe that? I believe it with all my heart. Amen. Well, hey, let's open our hearts and let's uh, prepare to receive God's word today. Lord, we pray that you'll help us understand what John the Baptist meant when he said, Lord, we need you to increase and we need to decrease for that to happen. Lord, show us how your power can take us from the season we're in into a season where we're so grateful for the things that you've done that we could have never done in our own strength. Holy Spirit, we come to you today and ask you to be our teacher in Jesus' name, and everybody said. We place this question on the top of our outline today, and that is, is God accomplishing more than you ask or thought that God could in your life? And let me just be real transparent and say that if you're a new Christian, then the answer to that question is probably going to be no. And the reason is that before God can begin to do more than we would even ask him to do, and before God can do more than we'd even imagine or think that he could do in our life, what needs to happen first of all is we have to learn truth. That's the reason that the Bible was written, that there are terms in there that teach us how God invites us to have an experience with him and how God invites us to have his grace begin to bless our life. So there are terms we have to learn. For instance, when the Bible says that we have been delivered from the, the regions of darkness, what does that mean to you? Well, if somebody lives with a lot of doubt, it means that I don't need to pray for you to get a good job or I don't need to pray for you to have God do something great in your life first. I need to pray for you to get delivered from that doubt so that God can begin to do the things that he's dreaming about doing in your life. Or if somebody says, man, I thought about committing suicide. Well, I don't just need to pray for your comfort. I need to make you understand that there are demon powers that really want to destroy people's lives and they want to damage people's lives and we need to learn to stand up to those powers. And then we don't just learn truths from the Bible, but the second thing that we have to learn is how to discern when God's really talking to us as people. And as a pastor, I love to hear people's stories whenever they've learned to walk with God and he begins to do for them things that are greater than God would ever ask them to do and beyond the things that they ever thought that God could do in their life. I heard a guy recently who was raised an Orthodox Jew, and he said his walk with God began when he started dating a girl who was a nominal Christian, and he went with her to her traditional church, and he said, the first thing I noticed was that it was a family. It was a community, a lot like our synagogue was. He said, the second thing I noticed was that they were more involved in the community helping people than our synagogue was, that we tended to live more isolated than they did. Then he said, the third thing I noticed, though, is they really didn't teach the, the, the Word of God. He said, we were so big on the Torah in our synagogue. And then I thought the fourth thing was funny. He said, the fourth thing, he said, I didn't know that if everybody looked at their watch at the same time, that you could cause the minister to quit talking if you all did that. And uh, I'm so glad for cell phones because y'all don't wear watches anymore. And if you look at your cell phone, I just assume you're so into my sermon, you're looking uh, at the outline that we have online. But seriously, people worship God lots of different ways, don't they? And I want to start by reading a doxology from Ephesians 3, verses 20 to 21, where Paul tells us what our worship should accomplish as people. He wrote, Now all glory to God who's able through his mighty power that's at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So if God isn't doing more than I'm asking him to do, and if God isn't doing more than I thought God could do, Paul would say that you have to learn how to begin to experience God's power on the inside of your heart better than you are. And, and this is for every single one of us. It's a universal experience that should characterize people who attend church. Listen to the next verse. Paul said, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
again. So this isn't something that some Christians should be experiencing, but Paul said every single believer, this should be the normative experience for us. Now for some of you who are new believers, I'd encourage you this week to read the book of Ephesians from chapter 1 through the end of chapter 6. And it won't take you more than about 30 minutes and begin to ask yourself, do I understand what it means to be delivered from darkness? Do I understand that redemption means that if I let God work in my life, what sin has ruined, God will not only restore, he'll make it better than I ever dreamed that it could be in my life. Am I living in that place where God has lavished his grace upon me? And I feel like I have more answers than I have trouble or confusion in this area because of how I began to learn to walk with God in my life. That's what Ephesians 3 is calling us to as people. And if we begin to learn today what we're going to learn from a psalm that David wrote, it's going to become the personal experience that we have in our life as well. Now, you remember that a doxology from last week is the expression of an opinion or a view that brings praise to God. So we talked about how often in the Bible, after a prayer is prayed, there will be a doxology at the end of that prayer. And what the doxology is telling us is that if my my faith is alive, I'm going to experience what this prayer is saying I can experience. But if my faith dies, if I don't have a praise-filled, alive faith, then I'm probably not going to experience what this particular prayer says that I can experience. And Matthew 6.13 is a doxology. It wasn't in the original manuscript that Matthew uh, wrote down whenever he copied the Lord's Prayer, but, but later as there were manuscripts copied from that manuscript, uh, some believe that a monk probably was writing the Lord's Prayer and a spirit of praise came on him and he added this doxology. Now remember that the, the original canon of the New Testament, the 27 books, didn't come together until about three to four centuries after the church began. So the church fathers had seen the church so persecuted, nobody would have ever thought they could have overcome the persecution of Rome like they did, but they not only overcame, they became the official religion of Rome. And I think that probably could have influenced them when they said, you know, let's put a doxology on the end of the Lord's Prayer. And the doxology says this, that God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, when the Bible says that God's kingdom is something we can count on forever, it's talking about God's ability to reign and to bring forth his will in the circumstance that I'm praying about. And the Bible says that God created the world and he can do whatever he pleases. So when we pray, we're to pray with faith that God can fulfill the very thing that he's promised us he'd do. When we pray the power that refers to God's ability to answer our prayer, that not only does God have a will, God has the capability of fulfilling the will that he's talking to us about. And then the third thing, the glory refers to God's anointing, which we'll talk about next week. And we're going to see in David's life how we begin to pray for God's power to exceed what we're thinking about in our hearts. But before we do, I want to share an important illustration that Isaiah used in the Old Testament. Testament, Jesus used this illustration as well in the New Testament. And it's in Isaiah 27 first where Isaiah is talking to the people about how sin has put people under yokes. And because these yokes are on people's lives and these influences are on people's lives, there's a lot of uh, burdens and a lot of pain among the people. And that's what happens, right? When lust begins to, to rule in homes more than love, there's a lot of burdens. There's a lot of separations. There's a lot of difficulty. Whenever bitterness settles in on a home because people have disagreements, instead of love and forgiveness and belief that something good can happen, what happens is there's a, a literal yoke that begins to control the people, and it determines the outcome that those people are going to experience. So Isaiah used this, and he said to the people, so it'll be on that day that the burden will be removed from your shoulders and the yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fatness. Now let me read it in another version. This is the New King James Version. 
and it says the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now, those sound very different, right? The anointing oil versus fatness. So let's, let's describe what Isaiah was talking about because most of the time in the Bible, the Hebrew phrase used is translated anointing oil throughout the Bible. But Isaiah was talking to agricultural people, and he was telling you when God's truth gets big enough on the inside of you, and whenever the Holy Spirit's uh, ability to work gets strong enough on the inside of you, what's going to happen is it's going to be nothing for God to break that yoke that was causing you to live this life that was going places you really didn't want your life to go. You know, my dad was a good man, and I remember whenever he was young, he taught all of us to drive. But I have one sister who's more hospitable than the rest of us, and she's also just a bit more emotional than the rest of us. And if you know my dad, though, he was a good man. He was also an exasperating man at times. And, uh, you know, my kids may say that the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and uh, I couldn't say much if they did say that. But anyway, he took my sister, and he decided he was going to teach her to drive by taking her on the busiest road in our entire county because bless God, he was going to teach her that she could conquer the busiest road on the first day. And I'll never forget, my mom and I were sitting on the back porch, and <laughs> she pulled into our driveway, which was about 20 yards long, and she just pulled into the end of it, threw the car in park, and she ran 30 yards up to the back porch to my mom and I. And she didn't cry, but mamas can notice whenever you're on the verge of crying. And all I'm going to say is that that night we ate my sister's favorite meal, which also happened to be one my dad hated. So how many of you know mamas have a way of teaching without saying a word, right? And uh, my sister, it took her time because she had a fear and she had something that, that kept her from making it to where she could have made it. And the Bible says that happens to us as people. And we don't recognize sometimes that it's the power of the enemy that's keeping us from the marriage that we want. It's the power of the enemy enemy that's keeping us from reaching a dream. And Jesus, when he talked about the same thing Isaiah did in Matthew 11 of the New Testament, listen to what Jesus said, I want you to come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I want to give you rest. And he said, I want you to take my yoke on you, and I want you to learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you're going to find rest for your souls. What Jesus was saying is not only will a relationship with God where we learn truth and where we live, we're hearing his voice and under his anointing, not only will it free us from things that burden us, but Jesus said, if you'll take my yoke, if you'll let me lead you in life, you're going to learn things that cause you to begin to experience answer prayer. Now, David wrote us a psalm to learn how to do this, and the psalm is called a mitkom of David. And there aren't many psalms that are called mitkom. There are 75 uh, psalms that are attributed to David, 73 of them right on the psalm. He wrote a psalm of David. There are two more that he's referenced in the New Testament, but only six of the 75 psalms attributed to David are called miktoms. And, and a miktom, if you, if you Google it, it's something that is kind of a vague word, but it's not that hard to understand. The root of the word means golden. And the word normally describes a lid that's, that's placed over something that's very, very valuable. So when David writes the word miktom, what he's saying is, I'm going to teach you something that's very, very valuable, and it's going to unlock gold in your life that's hidden to most people people. Now, most scholars believe that David wrote this whenever he was experiencing the events in 2 Samuel 7 or else in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And this is when David had already come to the point where the people watched him and he overcame, you know, the power of their king Saul. He had delivered them from the powers of the foreign enemies that were all around them. And so the people lived lives of great insecurity before they 
David became their king, and David showed them that God can take us from insecurity to stability in life. They lived a life of great lack before David became their king, and David showed them God can take us from lack to a place of abundance. And then they lived with great disunity before David became king, and David showed them, listen, God can take us from a place of disunity to a place of great unity and joy. And in this place, David looked at Nathan the prophet one day and he said, man, I built this beautiful house for my family and God's blessed us so much. I want to build a house for the ark of God. And Nathan said, that's a great idea, David. And then when he started to leave, God dealt with the prophet Nathan and he came back to David and he said, that's a great idea, David, but God doesn't want you to build it. He wants your son Solomon to build it. And then God began to talk about the purpose of of us coming to church because God's glorified whenever there are beautiful churches and cities because people drive down the road and, and, and it says, you know what, there, there are a lot of people who must believe that there's God. There's a God, but what glorifies God more is when they come into church and the way we're experiencing God is something that causes them to know that the desires that God has put in their hearts can come to pass. Can you say amen? So God said to David, that's great you want to build me a house, but here's what I'm thinking. I want to bless you even way more than you're blessed right now. And the Bible says that David sat down and he said to the Lord, who am I? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Oh, sovereign Lord, don't miss the word sovereign because he's saying his is the kingdom. He can do what he pleases. Oh, sovereign Lord, is this your usual way of dealing with people? And, and Paul would answer that question, absolutely, that God loves doing more than people think that he could do in their life, more than they even ask him to do in their life. But it's in that circumstance that David took the time to, to write this myth that we're going to read this morning. And it tells us how to experience God exceeding our hopes through his power at work in our heart. And it starts by saying, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. Now, what's a refuge? It's a place where we are protected from distress. It's a place where we're protected from danger. But it's not just that. If you study the history of America, one of the most important refuges, per se, one of the most important forts is Valley Forge. Because when General George Washington gathered his troops there, we were being defeated. Uh, many people thought we were going to give up, and General Washington encouraged the troops. He comforted the troops. They brought in trainers to help our troops. I believe that God gave George Washington a word from God about how to, how to lead an attack on Christmas Day, I believe it was. And uh, the whole war turned around because of what happened in a refuge. And I think that's what David had in his mind when he said, now if you want God to exceed your hopes, it starts with making him your refuge where he begins to protect you and love you and talk to you. And then he said these five things. He said, and in this refuge, I say to the Lord, you're my Lord. Apart from me, you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. So you notice the first thing that David said is if we want God to do more than we've ever dreamed he could do, we need to start saying or confessing the right things in our life. To confess means to say the same thing that God says. And so if you want God to move, you need to start saying over your situation what God says. We can't say, I married that bozo and uh, I didn't think he was going to do all this. No, that's not what you want to say. What you want to say is, God promised me he could join homes together in a way that nobody could put them asunder. Can you say amen? You can't say, I can't believe all this happened to me. My life could be so much better if all this didn't happen to me. No, what you got to say is the path of the righteous is like the first gleaming of dawn, and it's going to shine ever brighter until the full light of day. Amen? See, confession means to start saying the same thing that God says about our circumstances. And when you start, 
it feels so shallow because your circumstances seem so permanent and what God has to do many times seems like it's so much. So here's a good way to think about your confession. When I wake up in the morning, I have a little dog whose name is Sadie and she flirts too much with the dogs in my community. So sometimes I wonder where Sadie is. So I step outside my door and I begin to call Sadie. And if she can hear me and she, and she hears my voice, Sadie will come and she'll sit on my lap while I read my Bible. Now, when I'm calling Sadie, why am I calling her? Because she's not here. And when we call out to the Lord and we're making our confession, why are we making that confession? Because our answer isn't here. Now, yes, it feels shallow because it's not all we do. It's just the first step to having God begin to answer our prayers. David said the second thing is we then consecrate ourselves to God's presence. Verse 4 says, those who run after other gods are going to suffer more and more, and I won't pour out my libation to uh, of blood to such gods or take up their name on my lips. Now, how many of you read about pouring out libations of blood and you think, Pastor, I don't do that. You don't have to worry about me committing that sin right there. But, but we have to understand what he's talking about. When he says libations, he's talking about offerings. And what David's saying is, I'm not going to offer my time. I'm not going to offer my focus. I'm not going to offer my allegiance to something that cannot take care of the problem that I'm facing. So let's put it this way. I will not find my comfort in Netflix. I will find my comfort reading God's Word and praying. I won't find my happiness in a hobby that causes me to escape the problem that I'm in. I'll find my happiness in getting together with other believers and, and having them help me find God's will. You know, Pastor Larry said something to me so powerful because if you know his story, he started out in a really bad neighborhood. His father was very angry and very abusive. And he said, what really caused my life to become great is he said, I started coming into church and I started looking at people who were practicing God's word well and he said I'm going to start practicing God's word like they do and he said God cleaned up area after area of my life because I did that what happened exactly what David's talking about that first of all we start confessing that it's not what happened to me that's got to define my life. It's what God can make happen for me. Can you say amen? We consecrate ourselves to God. And then the third thing David said is we start gaining a confidence in God's power. He said, Lord, you alone are my portion and cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now, can I tell you something today? That totally describes the life that I get to live every day. But it didn't start there. It started with me coming out of uh, the way I was raised and wanting to know God more, wanting to understand terms in the Bible, wanting to know God was talking to me and I was listening to him and uh, my family didn't understand. This week, my uncle, who was 87 years old, went to heaven and I went to Woodlands to be a part of his service and it was such a joy because I remember whenever nobody in my family understood and I felt like my faith cost me my family. Now I get to talk to them and they understand there's a lot they want to know about God but it wasn't that way 30 years ago but can I tell you something when I think about how God gave me Tamara and God gave me my kids I'm telling you God's lot has fallen to me in pleasant places when I think about the chance I have this morning to pastor this church there is no other church I'd rather pastor in any other location in the world and I'm so excited about the purposes that God's going to fulfill through Faith Family Church, I can say his lot has fallen in pleasant places, but it doesn't happen overnight. It happens as we study the truths in the Bible and we say, are those really uh, truths that I understand? And am I applying these to my life? And we begin to apply them to the point that we have confidence when God talks to us. Now listen to the fourth thing that David talked about. He said, I'm going to praise the Lord who counsels me. And he said, even at night, he said, my heart's going to instruct me. 
Now, this tells us something, and that is, if we're not studying God's Word, and if we're not putting God's Word in our heart, there's not going to be anything to instruct us. So Christians who expect the Holy Spirit to tell them everything and do everything, but they don't spend any time in the Bible, you're never going to have God lead you like Christians who spend time in the Bible. But David says this, he said, I'm going to keep my eyes always on the Lord, and with Him at my right hand, I'm not going to be shaken. And I put for this point that we need to develop a cadence of praise in our life. You say, why do you use the term cadence of praise? Well, it's because if a great film producer writes a film, he creates every part of that film to make people feel something and learn something whenever they come to the end. Or when a great composer writes a piece, he wants this piece to make people understand something. And he wants people to feel something whenever they come to the end. You know the greatest composer and the greatest orchestrator in the world is the Holy Spirit. How many of you know it's an honor to have him at work in our hearts, knowing that in all things he's going to work for the good of those who love him and who live called according to his purpose, amen? And the times in my life whenever he's orchestrated things, I think back to, you know, when he came and, and he directed me to come to the city. And I'm not even going to share some of the intimate things he said to me, but nobody would have dreamed we'd be where we are today, but I knew he was orchestrating something. Or Michael is so kind. He's, my, my son Michael's he's like his mother in that he comes into a room and he's aware of everything that goes on in the room. His dad's the guy who tries to eat his hot dog and the ketchup goes on his shirt because he's not aware of much. Can you say amen? And I remember raising Michael that I, I just knew something wasn't quite right when I was raising him. And uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day and he brought the word out of my heart, and it was a scripture in Psalms where King David said that God's gentleness made me great, and God dealt with me about being more gentle as a dad, and I can tell you it changed the outcome of that relationship. Not that it was bad, it just made it better. Or let me tell you one of my favorite stories is in 1994, Jeffrey was born on a Thursday morning. And I spent Thursday night with Tamara in the hospital, Friday night. But when Saturday came, she was fine, and Michael had a flag football game. I had to coach him in. We were building our house out in the country at that time, and I wanted to check on construction. And so that morning, I got up, and I went and coached the football game. I looked over my notes for Sunday. I went out to look at the house, and, and Tamara's doctor called me. She said, Pastor Jim, uh, you need to get back to the hospital. And I said, why? She said, well, your, your uh, wife's blood pressure is really, really high, and I have her in a dark room by herself. Now, Jeffrey has made her blood pressure rise many times since that moment, but I knew it wasn't him this time. And I said, well, what's going on? And she told me, and I didn't understand it because of big medical words. I couldn't get them. So I said, well, what are you concerned about? And she said, well, quite frankly, I'm concerned she may die. And I thought, oh, well, I'm getting back to the hospital. And I called Dr. Solis. He preached the next day. And, uh, but I remember before I ran back to the hospital, I just sat by our house for just about five minutes. And I prayed. And I said, Lord, I've got four kids. And this would be horrible. And I'll never forget how sweet the voice of the Holy Spirit was. He said, she will be a happy mother of children. And I'll tell you, she has been for 27 and a half years. There may have been days she had to work hard on being a happy wife, but she has been a happy mother of children for 27 and a half years. And I'm telling you, God loves you so much. He wants you not to get overwhelmed. He doesn't want you to live under the wrong yoke because you'll never get led into what God has for you if you live under the yoke of the enemy. But he wants you to start confessing his word that it's going to come to pass in the situation you're in. He wants you to begin to be a person who consecrates yourself and say, 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 God, I know you want to do it, but I don't have enough of you. I need to spend time with you. He wants you to get a confidence in how his power is working in the situation that you're in. And he wants your life to have a cadence of praise where when you tell your story, how many of you want God's glory to be the biggest part of your story that people hear? Can you say Amen. And then David says one final thing, and we'll close with this. And he said, 
consider more God's eternal perspective. He said, therefore, my heart's glad and my tongue rejoices. Anywhere where the Holy Spirit starts working for good, what's going to happen is our hearts are going to be glad because we're going to know even though everything's not perfect, God's up to something here. And then he said, my body will rest secure. And I love this. He said, because you won't abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay, but you've made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Come on, somebody. How many of you know if Jesus is at work in our life, we've got to have some joy because he's, he's somebody who does what he promised. Can you say amen? You will have, you'll fill me with joy in your presence and then with eternal pleasure at your right hand. In other words, the normative Christian experience should be, first of all, man, I'm so glad for what God's up to in my life. I'm not what I want to be, not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be before Jesus stepped into my life. Can you say amen? We should have joy in our life. And then not only that, to think about the fact that as I age, which I haven't started to do much yet, just in case you're wondering, as I age, one day, I'm going to step out of time and I'm going to step into eternity. And I'm sure I'll be sad saying bye to my children and my grandchildren. But you know, at that point in my life, there are quite a few people over there I want to go see again too. And I'm going to enjoy having a body that's a little bit younger. Can somebody say amen? How many of you know it's a pretty incredible deal we have to have Jesus invite us into the family of God, right? And you know what? It's golden, y'all. It's golden. And how many of you are ready for God to do some golden things in your life in this season that we're in? So let's put our hand on our heart this morning. I want to pray for you. Lord, help us experience the golden things that you have for us. Lord, thank you for giving us this psalm where you lift the lid for us and you help us learn the things that cause us to live the life where truly God's doing more than we'd even ask him to do. And he's doing more than we thought could happen in our lives. And Lord, it's happening because we're not in control anymore. We're not asking God to do our thing. We're resisting the enemy when he tries to come in and create strife and division and fear and bitterness. We're not letting those things lead us to places that, Lord, the enemy wants us to go. But Lord, we thank you for the things that you're doing in our lives this morning. Lord, help us confess better your promises so we stay on the pathway to your blessing. Lord, help us live more consecrated. Let this be a year where, Lord, like Michael talked about, we make room for you to do the things that you want to do. And Lord, thank you that we're gaining confidence in our heart. And God, you're creating a cadence in our life. And God, as we consider what can be down the path, Lord, our heart gets filled with joy because you're so great. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your truth that we can count on. Lord, thank you for teaching us things about the spiritual world that make life so different. We're so grateful. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, before we go, let's all just stay for a minute in an attitude of prayer. If you would just bow your heads, maybe pray for the person around you, that'd be great. I know there are lots of people here today, and, you know, it's one thing to, to know about God. It's another thing to have God really save our life. And I love this scripture in the Bible. It says, for this reason, Jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil. You know, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to look up <laughs> and to see there's an evil presence doing a lot in the world. He's bringing suffering. He's bringing pain. He's dividing siblings. He's, he's bringing sickness. He's doing so much. The, the enemy's very, very active in our world. Why did Jesus come? Because he wants to destroy the work of the enemy. He wants to stop those things that sin's doing in people's lives. And you say, well, how's that happen, pastor? Well, when we do what we're getting ready to lead some people here today, maybe you're in church and you say, you know, Jim, I'm in church, but I, I know my heart isn't where it needs to be. It's not even where I want it to be. And today I want to start a relationship with God. Or maybe once you had a relationship with God, today you need to reconnect to God. If that's you, listen, the Bible says this in Romans 10, 13, it's beautiful. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
What that means is we can know about him, but whatever in our heart we say, God, I want to let you love me. God, I want to let you lead me. That's when life really begins to change. And if you're here today and you say, well, Pastor, that's the place I'm at. I'm ready to start a relationship with the Lord today. Well, we want to lead you. We want to help you call in the name of the Lord. So I'm going to count to three. On three, I want you to shoot your hand up right at your seat. And then we're going to pray with you at your seat. We're going to close my part of the service by calling on the name of the Lord. So you ready? One, two, if you're ready for God to take charge, three. Lift your hand up all over this place. Amen. Awesome, 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 awesome. No way I could get to all the hands. But if that's you, just lift your hand all over this place. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, well, church family, you can look up. Let's put our hand in our heart. Let's pray this with those who lifted their hands. Let's say, Jesus, thank you so much for leaving heaven and coming to earth so we'd know how loved we are how real God is, and how much blessing God can bring to people who will live for him. Jesus, today, I see sin at work in the world, and I say no to sin, and I say yes to you. I call forth your love. Thank you, Lord, for leading me into blessings I could never experience without you. And most of all, thank you, Lord, for heaven. Amen. Well, hey, can we give a big hand clap to those who prayed that prayer? And if you prayed that prayer... I, I think you probably noticed this morning that when you came into church, there's a lot of people here that have found a lot of joy in their relationship with God. And the reason we clap is because it multiplies our joy when we see God begin to do good things in your life. So that's what church is. It's a place where we learn to walk with God and where God answers prayers for people. And before you go, we want to help you experience that. So we prepared two things. First, on the seat back in front of you, there's something called the salvation card. On that card, you can let us know whether you're starting a relationship with God, whether you're returning to God. You can let us know if you want to be baptized, or you can let us know if you want to be a member of the church. And if you fill that out, one of our church leaders will get in touch with you, and they'll help you really begin to learn how to walk with God. We also have something by the giving boxes, so when you fill out that card and you take it to the giving boxes, when you put it in, you'll notice a white packet and that white packet has a book in it. It's called 30 Days to New Beginning. And uh, man, we're excited about you having a new beginning that leads to blessed endings. And that, that book's going to be a help. So, well, can we give them a hand one more time, church family? <laughs> give all those who prayed a great big hand. Amen. Well, good morning. Or good afternoon, church family. Great. Wasn't, aren't you glad you were in church today? Wasn't that a good word? Amen. How many of you are glad that uh, the more we grow in God, there's not a bondage that cannot be broken because of God's word, because of what he can do? Amen. Let's give Pastor Jim a good hand for sharing such a good word with us today. I want to receive our tithes and offerings for God's work, and I just want to echo what he said earlier about thanking those of you who showed up for Serve Day, and there were so many happy parents and students who got backpacks and school supplies, so thank you for work, and then we got to bless our social agencies that do so much good in our community. I tell you, we've got some generous people that live in our community. We want to thank our businesses, and thank you for just having a big heart. Can you give yourself a hand in our businesses that helped and all those who had a part? Amen. Our, you know, our, I want you to I ask you to continue to pray for our facilities team because they're working hard to finish our refresh, and there's uh, still the best is yet to be done. So how many of you will pray for them to do that? And I want to just remind you on uh, and thank you ahead of time on August the 13th is our uh, work day. Our work day is on Saturday. We always come together. We have a, a lot of fun working together and have good food. How many of you know there's good food around here? And, uh, but I want to thank you for that because $20,000 is saved 
saved when we have our work day. So that's a lot of money. How many think of some things you could do with $20,000, right? But, you know, we can do more ministry, and we can uh, support our missionaries in a greater degree because of that. So we thank you ahead of time. I do want to give you exciting news before we go home. I want to let you know uh, something that's uh, going to happen soon. On September 1st, we're opening an early uh, learning center for ages 0 to 2 here on campus. We're excited about it. You know, we've had K3 and up for a long time, but we're so excited to be able to extend it to birth to two years. I know parents, you know, you're important to us. We want to serve you well, and uh, it's an important and a needed area uh, in our church family or in our city, I should say, our community. So we are looking forward to that, and we, uh, how many of you know it's important that we have our kids in a place that we trust and that we feel comfortable with? Amen. And so uh, this, is, this is what I want to say. If you have a child that you would like to get in to our Early Learning Center, please don't wait. Call the school office tomorrow because you are our priority. We want to give you first, uh, the first opportunity to be a part. Also, there's some employment opportunities in our uh, Early Learning Center if you are looking for that. We have a few open. We have some filled, but a few open. So please call. Everybody say Monday. Monday. Don't wait. Please call because you want, we want you in there. We would have liked to start it uh, the day of school when school opens, but COVID slowed us down. There was some furniture that we couldn't get on time to be able to open it. How many of you are done with COVID, right? So anyway, but we look forward to it. And Faith Family, I just want to say thank you for making this kind of ministry happen. Thank you for being faithful in your tithes and offerings. How many of you know good days are ahead for us? Amen. So let's prepare our hearts to give this morning. Offering envelope, let's pray over our, our gift this morning. Father, we thank you for the difference that we get to make for you, Lord, by giving today. Father, we thank you for all the people that you have blessed and you want to bless in our community and beyond through the prayers, through the service, and through the giving of the gifts today. Father, thank you for a church family that honors your house, that's faithful, Father, and passionate about your work. You said you will honor those who honor you. So, Father, we give with cheerful hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Faith Family, thank you for being in God's house today. You know, uh, when we give God the first part of our week, how many of you know he blesses the rest of our week? So thank you for fulfilling the seventh commandment by being in the house of God. Our prayer team will be available after service if you want personal prayer. Can you stand and let me pray a blessing over you before you go? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thanks for being in God's house. Have a fantastic week. Amen. Church family, thank you guys so much for tuning in for service today. We knew that God was going to show up in today's message. And we just want to encourage you before you sign off, man, ask yourself those three questions at the bottom of the outline. What was the Holy Spirit speaking to you today th throughout today's service? How is he encouraging your heart? Number two, what are you going to do about those things? And number three, well, how can we pray for you? Also, if you prayed that prayer for salvation for the first time, or maybe you're rededicating your heart to God, we just want to let you take a moment to let you know that we're so proud of you. You just made the best decision you could ever possibly make. And you may have questions like, okay, what now? What's my next step? We're here to help. Please let us know that you pray that prayer because number one, we have a, a gift of resources we want to get into your hands, just a practical gift of resources. And then we have direction in there of the practical next steps that you can take. You know, this series is titled Creating a Beautiful World Together. And the word key, that's key right there is together. We need each other. We need um, a community of faith and community of believers to help us walk out our our best life with Christ. We can't do it alone. So we just want to make sure that you know and echo how important that is, not only to our heart, but to God's heart. So we just want to encourage you, man. Let us know. Allow us to be a part of what God is doing in your life. We love you guys so, so much. We pray you have the best week ever, and we'll see you guys on Wednesday. Love you guys.